In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our dear Master, our dear Savior, Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us completely. Today, dear Lord, we're asking that you show us how we could abide in you more and that how you would abide in us. I pray, dear Lord, that you would unite yourself with our senses, our thoughts, our hearts, our will, our actions, and our purpose. I pray, dear Lord, that you would guide us. Help us, O Lord, to grow deeper, deeper into you, and that you would grow deeper, deeper into us. I pray for your grace and your mercy and your Holy Spirit to work in us through the intercession of our beloved St. Mary and all your saints. Hear us when we, your children, say to you with one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So you guys have your Bibles today for the Bible study. I don't know if you recall our uh, our topic a couple of weeks ago, and Peter and I are thinking of making that kind of almost like a theme for the year, and it was abiding in Christ. We talked about the, the fruit-bearing tree and how Christ said, you know, without me you can do nothing, you can bear fruit, but if you are in me you can be fruitful, and so we're going to talk about that uh, kind of throughout the year. We're going to start a series, God willing, soon, maybe next week, specifically on abiding in Christ. But today I wanted to share with you a verse uh, that really caught my mind. And it goes along with this theme. It's in the book of 1 Corinthians. I think a lot of us have read 1 Corinthians many times. But I was just driving and I heard this verse. And I was listening to the whole book. And all of a sudden something hit me that I had never seen before. Before I go into it, I want you to understand what Corinth is like. The city of Corinth at that time was a very wealthy city because it was a perfect area for trading. So they were wealthy, and it was actually a very terrible, sinful place. It was like the Las Vegas of that time. People of different ethnicities were always coming into the port for trading. Lots of sailors were coming in. You know what happens when there's lots of sailors? <laughs> at that time, sexual immorality was rampant, and it was really bad. They were just dividing against each other. One of the problems of this church was that they were divided. One would say, oh, I follow Apollo, so I follow Peter, I follow Paul. And he's like, St. Paul was so upset. And he had a very difficult time in Corinth. Uh, the Jews didn't accept him. He had to preach to the Gentiles. And so he was there for a year and a half. The church was a lot of it Gentiles who had their own traditions and their own uh, customs from before becoming Christian. So that's a little bit of the background of why he's writing this letter because of the great immorality that was happening in Corinth. And he said that's not really appropriate for Christians. But then uh, in verse chapter 1, verse 9, he says this. God, well, let me start a little bit earlier. In verse 7. So that you come short in no gift, waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will confirm you to the end that you may be blamed. The fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You were called into fellowship with with Jesus Christ. And this really blew my mind. I tried to think, how can I portray this? Okay, you know who the people of Corinth were. Very evil, immoral people. Imagine the Queen of England, okay? She's got her son Charles. And she says, I want you to go, tells her servants, I want you to go and find the people in the prisons, go find the people in the bad areas, and come and bring them to play with my little son Charles. Would any of you guys do that? Like, oh, go find the people, the, the children of the prisoners. Go find, I want them to come play with my children. Anyone have that same desire, that same wish for your children? 
What's the concern? What's the concern? Why don't you want them to play with your children? Ah, so you're worried that fellowship with your children would cause your children to be different. So then why does God want us to be in fellowship with His Son? Not because we're going to affect His Son, but because His Son is going to affect us. And so if you look at it in, in verse 3, he says, um, sorry, in verse 2, he says, To the church of God who is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. We're called to be saints. What does the word saint mean? It comes from the word agios. Holy, set apart. He says, we were called to be holy. So that's why I need you to have fellowship with my son. I don't think we understand if we were, we're supposed to be in the position of those street children from the poor areas where all the crime and all the evil is, and we're called to have fellowship with his son. Do we understand the privilege? Do you think, like if you were to take street kids from like some poor village and Egypt or like, you know, these countries, like African countries, like, oh, we want you to, to sit now and play with a king. You're like, what? Me? I think we forget the privilege of the fellowship with the Son. And uh, this is a very common theme. If you look in the first epistle of St. John, it says very often fellowship with the Father and the Son. Very often that word fellowship is used. Fellowship is a very strong, what does fellowship mean? Sometimes I feel like we almost misuse it. Like, oh, we're going to all go to In-N-Out, and that's fellowship. Actually, it's a little bit different. Christ is, God's not saying, I want you to go and eat In-N-Out with my son. The word fellowship comes from the word kinonia, which also means communion or sharing with. So God is saying, I want you to be in communion with my son, and I also want you to be sharing with my son. What is this fellowship that the father and the son had their love was perfect it was eternal it was inseparable he's like that's another form of fellowship where they shared everything they were one he kind of wants us to be the same with his son jesus christ so i want you to look at chapter six so we're going to look at first corinthians a lot we're going to go back and forth but let's look at chapter six Verse, I have verse 12. No, it's not it. Sorry. Okay, I'll find it. <laughs> It'll come to me eventually. Okay, so the purpose of the fellowship, we're called to be saints. It's to be sanctified. So the purpose of this fellowship with his son is for us to be changed, to be like him. So, how do you get those people from there to be with your son? He had to do something. So if you look at chapter 6, verse 20, and chapter 7, verse 23, let's look at 620. How did this fellowship begin? Because we were bought at a price. If you look in chapter 7, verse 22, he says, For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. How do we get to have this fellowship with the Son of God? He purchased us. He had to do some type of preparation in order for us, the street children, the poor, the beggars, to become in fellowship with His Son. He purchased us. We forget that. We forget what was the price of our purchase. That was an incredible price. He paid so much. It meant that much to Him for us to have fellowship with His Son. We need to realize and not take for granted what it took for us to have fellowship with his son. He had to sacrifice his son to do it. 
that's a tremendous, tremendous offering and a tremendous blessing. Now, let's say you bring the street kids. Okay, let's say you're, in the, you're queen of England. You bring them to the palace. Do you just let them in the house? What do you need to do for them first? Actually, that's exactly what Christ did for us. So let's look in chapter 6. He was saying how in verse 8, he says, You yourselves do wrong and cheat. You do these things to your brethren. Do you know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit were justified. In order for this fellowship to happen, a lot had to be done. He had to purchase us. He had to free us. He had to prepare us. He prepared us by washing us and cleansing us. We forget that too. Now I want you to know that it wasn't like a one-time washing. He continually washes and cleanses us for us to continually have fellowship with His Son. It doesn't make sense for us to keep remaining dirty like we were washed once and then you go back and be dirty full of our sins and our iniquities and then come back. Oh yeah, l l no, 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 no. Every time you come back, let's be cleansed. Not, not like you need to clean yourself. What does he do? He cleanses. He cleanses. So you say, I want to have fellowship with the Son. I want to come see the Son. He says, but you need to be cleansed. You say, well, I, I can't. Okay, I'll cleanse you. He's the one who cleanses us and prepares us and allows us to draw close to His Son through that. So we have the purchase and we have the preparation. And in chapter 6, verse 12. All right. So then, how does the beginning happen? So what does He start sharing with us? This important part, he mentions this twice in 1 Corinthians. In order for us to have this fellowship with his son and him to start sharing, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, this is something I think we should all know. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? whom you have from God. So in order for this fellowship to be made more real, for it to be made possible, He had to give us His Holy Spirit. Of all the gifts He could have given us, this is probably the greatest one. Everything, and, and even, even Jesus Christ says, the Spirit takes from the Father and gives to me. The, the Spirit takes from God and He's the one that gives it to us. We can do nothing without the Holy Spirit. We can have no fellowship. If you don't believe me, look at chapter 12, verse 3. If you look at chapter 12, verse 3, this is how the Holy Spirit works in us from the beginning. It says, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The very first part of our Christianity saying Jesus Christ is Lord is by the Holy Spirit. In the Coptic Church, in the Orthodox Church, we believe that everything that we do is by the grace of the Holy Spirit. You cannot know God. You cannot understand His Word. You cannot follow His will. You cannot be pleasing to Him without the work of the Holy Spirit in you. So for Him to say you are now a temple of the Holy Spirit, wow. Do you understand, like, we always think of God as so far. There's this, this saying, God the Father was God above us. God the Son was God among us. God the Holy Spirit is God inside of us. A lot of time, keep having the mentality of God that's so far above. We're forgetting the God who is so much inside. God! The creator of the universe is inside. 
That's unbelievable. What this fellowship, he's sharing so much to the point that he's going to put his spirit inside of us. That's amazing. That is unbelievable. So, what is the uh, sharing? He shared the Holy Spirit, which is the greatest part. And you realize when we were talking about our series, Abiding in Christ, it doesn't happen without the Holy Spirit. Him in us. And this allows us to be in Jesus Christ. Now, um, I wanted to look at some of the... So we said the beginning of the fellowship is to say Jesus Christ is Lord. One of the things that's the end of this fellowship. Like, we don't start here, but we can eventually get there. If you look at the last couple of verses in chapter 2, I love this part. So I'm going to just explain it to you and then I'll give you the last verse. He says, Who knows the things of a man but the spirit of a man? Who knows the things of God but the spirit of God? He says, And we have the spirit within us. So if you look at the very last verse in chapter 2, it says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? He says, But we have the mind of Christ. The very beginning of the fellowship is to say Jesus Christ is Lord. The very end of it is to say, we have the mind of Christ. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, one of the most beautiful passages in all the Bible, he says, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. I used to read that and i say, well, how are we ever going to have the mind of Christ? And then St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we actually have it. We actually have it. How? If you read, if the Holy Spirit is the one that knows everything about God and the mind of God and the wisdom of God and we have the Holy Spirit, then it's possible that we could have the mind of Christ. How amazing would that be if we had the mind of Christ? What would that look like? I can only imagine what it would look like if we have the mind of Christ. But if you have the mind of Christ then you have to realize that we're going to start sharing the purpose of Christ. So if you look in Philipp, sorry, in uh, 1 Corinthians 3.9, it says, For we are God. We are fellow workers, so now we are sharing in the purpose of Christ. And if you look at St. Paul and all that he's doing, especially chapter 9, he talks about, I have become all things to all men. I became a Jew to the Jew, a Greek to the Greek. I become all things to all men so that I could do what? By all means do what? Save some. Now we're fellow workers. What a privilege. We are now on God's team. We're not his, Now we're fellow workers. We're same mission, same purpose. What's amazing, he said, he didn't say, okay, we're just working for God. He says, no, we're working with God. Right next, so in our, what is our purpose now? To bring people to the kingdom. That all, by all means, we might save some. We have a new purpose. Fellowship with the Son isn't just about us. It's about fellowship with all of mankind. So this fellowship is very special now that we have a new purpose. And I, I wanted to go back to, well, how do we become you know, fellow workers in the mind of Christ in Philippians, sorry, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7. He says, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom of God, which ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers... we finally understand the mystery. The mystery was revealed to us. So he says in verse 10, but God has revealed them to us through his what? Through his spirit. Now all of a sudden, we're bringing God close into Christ's, God's house, and now the mysteries are being revealed. You know like, 
You might be friends with someone. You don't really know who they are until you've gone to their house. Right? And then all of a sudden, you see what they like. Oh, this is a soccer family. Oh, they like to go here on vacations. Oh, they're broke. Oh, they're wealthy. You, you know who they Once you've gone in, once things are revealed to you, now we have the privilege of God revealing His great plan to us. What an awesome thing. You're always wondering about these things of God and like, you know what? With the Spirit of God, the mysteries are revealed. That's true fellowship. When you begin to understand His mind, His plan for mankind, His way of thinking and His way of acting. That's true fellowship. You know you are in close fellowship with someone when you know them, their mind, and you almost know them inside and out. When they have revealed to you who they are. This is an amazing aspect of the fellowship. But with this fellowship comes a responsibility. If you look at chapter 6, so in chapter 6, this is one of the most convicting passages in the New Testament about sexual purity. There was a lot of prostitution, a lot of sexual immorality. And uh, he was saying, listen, you can't do this. <laughs> he says in verse 15, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. He's like, okay, you're part of the body of Christ. Can you imagine joining Christ to a harlot? He's not saying, I mean, what, is it, what does it have to do with Christ? Like, I'm, I'm me, and I, I did a sin with a harlot. Okay, fine. He's like, no, you're, why? Because it says, you are joined in one spirit with him. You are a part of Jesus Christ. And there's a responsibility if you are going to sin with the body of Christ. He says, you have a responsibility. You are no longer your own. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are a member. You're joined with one spirit with Christ. So you have a responsibility. Your responsibility is to try to live holy. And if he gives you the Holy Spirit and he gives you the mind of Christ, then the responsibility, I think chapter 11, verse 1 is a verse. It's very easy. It's all ones. First Corinthians 11, 1. Everyone knows this verse, right? It's very simple. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. So what is the responsibility? St. Paul says, imitate me. The body should represent the one that's driving the whole body, the head. And how can we do that if we're not imitating Christ? So the fellowship becomes even stronger when we're now trying to imitate Christ. Christ. Don't, don't imitate me. Imitate St. Paul and imitate Jesus Christ. Now, how often is that something on our mind? When you wake up in the morning, you say, I am a member of the body of Christ. How do I reflect that in my actions? Jesus Christ, help me to understand how I can think like you, speak like you, act like you, and love like you. We need to start asking for God, and you, by the way, you can't just wake up tomorrow and I'm going to imitate Christ. You know, I'll just be Christ tomorrow. It takes at least a week. or No, it's not something that just happens. It's the Spirit of God working in you, but it has to be your mentality. I belong to Him. I'm no longer my own. I am joined in one spirit with Him. So we've talked about how we've been purchased. We've been prepared. We see the potential of having the mind of Christ and Him revealing. Then we have a shared purpose with Christ. Now we have responsibility. St. Paul really goes into this idea of fellowship because he even talks about, does anyone know what 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is about? Off the top of your heads. Marriage needs to happen too. I'm not going to, he doesn't, this is not like a sermon on like how he, how husbands and wives, that, that's more like in Ephesians, but he says there actually needs to be fellowship. In Look in chapter 9, verse 24. 
If you ever want to see a great example of service and ministry, look at chapter 9. But in chapter 9, verse 24 says, Do not those. A crown. Theirs was made of olive leaves. It was not that exciting. But like he says, run to obtain a crown. The fellowship that we are invited to is to raise. He says, run as if you're going to obtain the prize. Many of us are very competitive people. Some of us have had competitive natures with each other since we were teenagers. And yet we will do anything to compete with each other. But he says, compete for the crown race because that's a privilege if you read second timothy 4 7 he says and god will give a crown to all those who have been faithful and loved his appearing he has a desire to give you a crown why do we deserve a crown it's really not because of anything that you could have done without him it's all because of what you can do through him and through this fellowship with him he desires to reward you he desires to crown you now if you're like those street children and you bring them to your house, you've cleaned them, now they're in your house, you've revealed things, what do, what do we normally do when you invite guests over? You feed them. Let's look at how we're fed. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, here he's referring to something in the Old Testament, but we'll, we'll see it in the New Testament. He says, he's talking about how when the people were going through the wilderness, and he says, in I do not want you to be unaware that our fathers were under the was Christ. He says, I fed them a spiritual food and a spiritual drink, and the drink was Christ. Well, if you look at chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, So it says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? That word communion is the same word as kononia and fellowship. So he says, this is it. He says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the same fellowship with the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the com communion of the body of Christ? He says, now I'm giving you the best thing. You come to my house and now I'm going to feed you with myself. So ever since this started to hit me, when I come to church, this is my prayer. God, I wish to have fellowship with your son. I don't want to just stand here and pray for a couple of hours and walk away. What I desire is the sharing, the partaking of your son. I want this fellowship. I want this intimate union where if you were here during the fraction of the liturgy, that last thing that Abuna was praying, I was blown away. It was all about uniting us. He says, we're eating openly, but unite us secretly. Unite, unite with my senses. I was like, it was all about fellowship with the Son. I don't know how he did that, but like somehow God revealed to me, just do that fraction today. It was all about the fellowship with the Son. Our senses, our mind, our heart, our decisions, our life, our will, our purpose, let everything be. So when you come to church, say, I wish to have fellowship with the Son. Okay? I'm almost done. But in chapter 12, verse 13, I love this part. He says, For by one Spirit, again, by that one Spirit again, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. Of the Spirit of God. And all I can say is, Open your mouths wide open. You have the opportunity to drink of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes we're like, no, I'm not thirsty. The opportunity, if you look at all the amazing saints and all the wonderful fathers, the holy people, they were drinking of the Spirit and they were never done drinking. We are invited to fellowship in this amazing house, in this amazing relationship. We're being fed the most spiritual and blessed food and we can say no i'm not thirsty or you can say give me i'll take it 
So be open to drinking. From, how do you drink from the Holy Spirit? Drink much from the Word of God. Drink much in prayer. Drink much in the liturgy. Like the Holy Spirit, God is pouring the Holy Spirit into us, and we're saying, I want to drink of your Spirit. There's all kinds of waters, all kinds of drinks, but I know coffee's up there. For us, that's like we're willing to drink a lot of but drink, I desire to drink of your Spirit. He doesn't give cheaply. He's very generous. But do you want to drink of the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. Absolutely. That is the one that should be one of our greatest desires. The other thing he does, he's so rich and wealthy and generous, so then what else does he do? He's given you food, he's cleansed you, and now you come to his house, he's not going to let you leave without gifts. He's going to give gifts. If you look at chapter 12, it's all about gifts. He says um, in verse 1, now concerning spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles. You were carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say Jesus is the Lord except by the Holy Spirit. He says, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, the one that gives the gifts. Differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. And the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. And if you go to verse 11, it says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. So the Spirit is the gift giver. And you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. So the one inside of you is wanting to give you gifts. How amazing is it? Who knew that we could have all these gifts? There are people who like who maybe come to Christ when they're older, and they were one person before, then they come into the body of Christ, and they're like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm new. All of a sudden, my minds are cleared. I have this gift of lifting people up as opposed to before I was using people, trying to take advantage of them. Now all of a sudden, instead of stealing, I'm giving. I'm generous. Now all of a sudden, instead of judging, and now I'm loving. All of a sudden, these are gifts. The Spirit is giving so many gifts, but the gifts are for the profit of of all. There are the healings and the preachings and the teachings and the education and all the services that you guys, many of you, I know you guys are, you guys are running the church by all the gifts God has given you and all the things that you're doing for the church. It's amazing, this fellowship. Now he's giving us his spirit, the most amazing food, and he's giving us the most amazing gifts. And then this whole idea of giving gifts, and he says we're all members of one body. St. John Chrysostom says something about this, and it's not like this virtual, okay, I'm part of, you know, the body. He says, you are a part of Jesus Christ himself. I mean, in this chapter, he talks about someone is the eye, someone is the ear, someone is the hand. So you are now part, not part of just the body. You are part of Jesus Christ himself. This fellowship is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. The last thing, two things. This whole fellowship happened because of chapter 13. What is 1 Corinthians 13? Everybody knows 1 Corinthians 13, right? It's about love. Absolutely. So when he was talking about gifts in chapter 12, all these gifts, if you look at 13, 13, and now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. The reason of this fellowship is because of his love. If you look at verse 8, it's actually one of my favorite verses in this chapter. Verses 7 and 8. His love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. We could not be part of this fellowship if his hope did not us, if his love did not believe in us, it did not hope in us, if it did not endure in us. So because of that, his love never failed, and now we can have fellowship with the Son. Again, the whole concept of the Son, of the King, going to have fellowship with the, the street, dirty street kids makes no sense unless you understand this concept of love. Then the last two things, if you go to chapter 15, does everyone know what 1 Corinthians 15 is about? 
1 Corinthians 7 is about marriage. 1 Corinthians 13 is about love. 1 Corinthians 15 is about the resurrection. You guys need to know that it's about the resurrection. But one more transforming part about this whole fellowship. His fellowship transforms us. If you look at verse 9, he says, I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle. This is St. Paul saying, I'm the, wor the least. I don't deserve to be called. He says, but because I persecuted the church of God, I was horrible. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And by his grace toward me was not in vain. And I ended up laboring more than they all. But not I, the... This is one of the most beautiful parts of the fellowship is that it's transforming. St. Paul says, I did not, des I was persecuting the church. Now I'm laboring more than all the apostles. It's not me. It's because of that fellowship and the grace given towards me that now I, I mean, if you were to ask me, I'm biased, I love St. Paul, but I think he was the greatest of the apostles. How? By the fellowship, by the grace, by drinking of the Spirit, by being eating of the spiritual food, of understanding his purpose, of acquiring the mind. By grace of God, I am what I am. This fellowship transforms us. And you know what would stink if this fellowship was just for a little while? But what did I say chapter 15 is about? It's about resurrection. And if you look at chapter 15, verses 52 to 56, he says this, in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Again, it keeps transforming us. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin and law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In most of our lives, many of the people that will meet on this earth, our relationships will end when we die. With God it isn't. It actually even gets better. There's new incorruption, new immortality, and this fellowship is eternal. What an amazing plan. What an amazing gift. That he says, I love you so much, and I don't want this fellowship just to be for a bit. I want it to be forever. Do you want it to be forever? Then we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. As a member of Jesus Christ's body, as a member of Jesus Christ himself, this fellowship is unbelievable. Enjoy it. Appreciate it. Don't take it for granted and seek it. Every time you come to church, every time you read the Bible, every time you pray, I seek fellowship with you and your son. This is all part of the abiding. And I pray that we will learn to abide more and more. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we pray? By the way, one of the requests of this Bible study is that you bring your Bibles to the Bible study. So next week, and every time you come to church, it's a good thing. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we stand in awe that you would look to us, those who are immoral, those who are dirty and filthy, those who have sights on ourselves, for you desire to draw us closer, for you desire to transform us, for you to desire to make saints out of us, for you desire to have this union with us forever. We're only beginning to understand. I pray, dear Lord, that you would reveal yourself and reveal your mysteries to us more and more. Dear Lord, oftentimes we don't feel like the fellowship is changing us because we're not drinking enough of your spirit. I pray, dear Lord, that you would open our minds and our hearts. Help us, O oh Lord, to be empty vessels, that we want to drink as much of your spirit, that you would fill us and overflow us always. Dear Lord, I pray that we would also not only have fellowship with you alone, but as members of the same body, that we would all have a greater and deeper fellowship with each other, sharing you amongst each other, sharing you amongst all those who are so far outside of the fellowship. I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to 
be enriched by your grace. And I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to become what you wanted us to be. I thank you for your love that never stopped. I thank you for your love that began everything. And I thank you, dear Lord, for your love that will sustain us through everything. Bless this church. Bless every family. Bless every home. Bless every concern on our hearts, every thoughts in our thoughts, our hearts and our minds. We ask, dear Lord, that you take care of them. Blessed are beloved members of the body who are sick, the members of our body who are suffering, for the members of our body who are in despair, for the members of our body who feel as though you are too far. Help them, O Lord, to realize how vital they are to this body. I pray, dear Lord, that you would work a mighty work in us by your amazing spirit. Help us, O Lord, to honor your temple and to offer it unto you day by day. Through the beloved prayers of inter and intercessions of St. Mary and the prayers of St. Paul and all your beloved saints who are members of the same body, hear us when we, your children, cry unto you with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one through Christ Jesus our Lord. For that is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever and ever. Amen.